Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. So Friedrich von Hayek, there's no question, was a great economist. And particularly for whatever counts for economics today, we would consider him a giant of the economic science. So he was a prominent member of the so-called Austrian School of Economics, and it is the school that is considered mostly in accordance with, let's say, the principles of a free society and of a free economy. So usually when you tell people about freedom and about the ideas of capitalism, the Google image in their mind, the first thing that comes is probably Friedman and Hayek. But today we're gonna to focus on Hayek and although we're going to pay, let's say the respect that, requ that is required to such a figure, also we're going to discuss his many contradictions not only in economics, but most particularly when he tries to transfer his economic thinking to politics. But also we're, tr we're going to try to understand why. Why is it that Hayek, the great economist, goes so wrong when he tries to approach issues such as, for example, uh, what is freedom, what is coercion, and these things. And we're going to do this with the capitalist and the scholar Jonathan Honig. Jonathan, hi. Uh Nikos, thank you, but I have to tell you, I'm a little bit embarrassed. Why Very embarrassed. Well, you know, I, I got the message that you, you wanted to do the show about Hayek. Uh, so I, I prepared a whole show about Selma Hayek. Uh, well, you know, the actress, I, I just assume that's who you were talking about. So I, I have a whole half an hour program about Selma Hayek. And I, I I'm so sorry. I, I, I really, I, Egg on my face. I'm so so sorry. I, I, it's okay. I'm sure it confused. was a, it, it was a play. It was it was a fun endeavor doing uh, the research. So not Salma Hayek, but Friedrich Hayek. So the first thing. So first to begin with, would you accept that Hayek? So when you tell people you are you know, someone who is in favor of freedom, in favor of capitalism, would you would you accept the notion that oh okay, so you're a Hayekian then, and you are one of these Hayek people? Because quite often, this is what I get when I tell people I'm in favor of the ideas around liberty. You're asking me? Yes. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, you know, often when I'll say I'm a fan of free markets, they'll say, oh, well, you know, you like von Mises, you like Hayek, uh, you like, uh, at, you're a fan of Adam Smith. And, you know, I always, I always have to say, actually, you know, I'm, a, I'm an objectivist, so I'm a I'm a believer in Ayn Rand's objectivism. And for them, oftentimes there is no difference. Uh, they see them all as the same. But I know that Harry Binswanger, among others, has written at great lengths about what's unique about Ayn Rand's perspective against von Mises, who she actually did recommend at one point, and Hayek, which he ne uh, she, he, she never recommended. So, um, you know, as, as a, for me, I'm a student of objectivism, not a student of Hayek at all, although I believe in free markets, as I understand Hayek also did. So help me understand maybe what's good right. in Hayek and what should be rejected from Hayek uh, from sure. an objectivist perspective. So let's start with Hayek's overall, let's say an overall evaluation. First of all, Hayek has a very, very exciting life. So Hayek is an intellectual. That's something that has to be recognized. So he starts as a socialist. He's in Vienna in the 20s. And then he comes across Mises and he, he reads Mises' book, Socialism. And Hayek says, after I read this, I was never the same person. So here we have someone who is open to the power of ideas, who is open to persuasion. And Hayek retained this throughout his life. He was very intellectually curious. Unfortunately, not so curious as to go and also read Ayn Rand. And we're going to discuss why this is a problem in his, in his thought. So his most popular works are things that even people within mainstream economics understand as something which is very praiseworthy. For example, his work on business cycles, where he follows his teacher Ludwig von Mises, his work on the effect of interest rates. So Hayek also recognizes that when you artificially lower interest rates, you give the wrong message to the market. So when, when a central bank does that, it gives the wrong message to the market. Therefore, this leads to crisis. So we discussed this previously when we discussed the Austrian school in general. So Hayek would say, when there is a crisis, don't see what happens during the crisis. See what was happening in the, in the boom that led to the burst. 
So up to this point, all thumbs up for Hayek. And then perhaps his most interesting point was about information and knowledge. And here is where we start raising our eyebrows. So what is the context here? The context is that Hayek wants to delegitimize central planning. And we're in the 30s and the 40s. And central planning seems to be the only game in town. Soviet Union, supposedly the economic miracle of the industrialization of Soviet Union with the five-year plans. Italy and, and Germany, Mussolini and Hitler. Again, mostly centrally planned economy. But also the United States. What have we got? Keynes, but also we have FDR. We have a planning in a so-called capitalist society. So it looks like planning is the only game in town. And Hayek intervenes and says, no. And there's one huge problem with planning. The issue of knowledge, the issue of information. The central planner cannot retain all information in his head. Therefore, we need the free market because, so you, Jonathan, know, for example, how much bread you need. Your baker needs how much bread to, to, to bake. So there are these myriads and myriads and myriads of decisions taken by random people. And this is why planning is impossible. Now, of course, I'm making it a super, super layman version. But right, that's, 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 what, that's what I understood that Hayek's objection uh, to central planning was, is that no central planner could know what, as you said, how much bread to make or, uh, you know, what interest rates necessarily should be. But, but, but I agree with that, Nikos. I also agree with that. But I also agree that it's even if a central planner did know, it wouldn't be right to force anyone to bake a certain amount of bread or to, to have, you know, so, so that's something unique about objectivism, right? Is that understanding of the mind and, and force, as I understand it, that Hayek just didn't get. Yes. So Hayek, in a way, appreciates capitalism because of its results. So Hayek says, look, capitalism is the only system that I can create a spontaneous order. Now, spontaneous order is a very beautiful way of viewing society. So I recommend it to students as an alternative to uh, the, the, the view where the state does everything. But here's the only issue with the spontaneous order. The problem is that spontaneous order, it looks as if it takes away the starting point and the fundamental. And the fundamental is the ability of every individual to think and take decisions and act upon these thoughts. Hayek does not see that. So in a way, and I'm making a very risky point here, so take this with a pinch of arm, just thinking out loud. Hayek, in a way, retains this bird's eye view on society. In some ways, Hayek retains this central planner's view, but he says, what's the best way to, to make all these things work? Leave it alone. Impose some rules, and we're going to see how these rules become more and more and more and more for Hayek, but mainly allow it to work. So this is Hayek of, uh, in one of his most famous uh, articles where he talks about information and the one where he talks about, and it's the use of knowledge in society, which is also, I think, one of the most cited articles. Uh, and it's a great one. People should read it, but also keep an eye for this attitude of Hayek to, in a way, almost undermine the agency of every individual and why this is the best thing in a free society, what, why this is the fundamental in a free society. Have we got any comments up to here or shall I move? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it almost reminds me a little bit of, do you know the, the book and there was a movie made on it, I Pencil? Yes, and exactly. Talk, and, and what I remember uh, uh, going to some, I don't know, it was a libertarian thing about I Pencil was that there was all that marveling of, some called it you know, the invisible hand, but no one talked about all the people along the way who had to think about their little part of the pencil and all the creativity, the entrepreneurship that goes into that. Now, I don't know if that's exactly what you're talking about, but you know, it's one of the things about objectivism that to me, it always seems to go back to the individual reasoning mind that so many of the libertarians and so-called free market types uh, discount or ignore altogether. Right. So up to this point, we've seen some of the best contributions of Hayek's in economics, but we keep an asterisk in our mind that, in our mind that they're based on some flips, on some shaky ground. So in a way he's right and he has brilliant insights, 
but not necessarily for the right reasons. And now this will show when we move to his more towards his politics. So we find ourselves in the aftermath of Second World War. So, and it's important to understand the context because Hayek, as many people in the right and the left, are basically freaked out with totalitarianism and what has happened in the world in the 30s and the 40s. So now Hayek is even more, even more skeptical towards the idea of, 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 of a, 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 a mind that can design and can organize. And, and he, so basically his point is we need to have to make sure that in this society, no one is, no one plays the role of the planner again, but he see how he completely then misunderstand this. So he has an essay called Individualism and Economic Order. And here we see Hayek misunderstanding individualism. And he says something like, the fundamental attitude of true individualism is one of humility towards the processes by which mankind has achieved things which have not been designed or understood by any individual and are indeed greater than individual minds. So in a way, Hayek sees society, the good thing in society as an evolution. However, I would, we, I would say, no, that's not the case. Steve Jobs had indeed this view that Hayek did indeed design and understand his vision. So the big leaps forward, of course, you are based on something previous in terms of inspiration, but the role of the individual is there. Ayn Rand did envision Atlas Rugged and Gold Speeds. Or put differently, Michael Jordan did envision completely changing the sport, or probably LeBron James even more. So when, so basically Hayek says, good individualism is when, when people are free and uh, they, this creates a nice hole. But fake individualism is when people think that they can play this role and uh, that, uh, that they can shape in a way society according to their own vision. Why is Hayek so worried about that? Because it reminds him fascism or Stalinism. So here, I think Hayek is really mixing up his concepts. He cannot understand what it means to create and what it means to force something on someone. Uh, this is you know, fascinating to me, Nikos. As I said, I mean, uh, as someone who, who really doesn't know much about Hayek, although I'll, I'll share my screen one more time. I, this is not, not Selma Hayek, but I, I did discover um, Harry Binswanger's very passionate defense of Rand versus Hayek. Not that Rand needs a defense, but basically explanation of, I think, a lot of what you're discussing here. And for people who are really into free market economics in particular, this is a great distinction to make that, you know, objectivism and Rand's perspective is very unique even against other so-called free market economists like Hayek. Right, and we're gonna get to, if you want to, Harry Binswager's point. And here when it goes completely, completely downhill. Where it goes downhill is when Hayek goes to his political writings. Here we have the road to serfdom, which is a good, a very interesting read. But then he writes two more books, which are, let's say his political thought. The one is, a constitution of liberty and the other is law legislation and liberty. So constitution of liberty is perhaps his most famous one and many liberals today consider it uh, also one of their most important texts. Funny historical highlight, when, and one of my favorite, my favorite Thatcher story ever, when Margaret Thatcher would have the members of her cabinet being skeptical and not wanting to, and telling her you're taking it too far, rumor has it she would take the constitution of liberty, bang it in the table and say, this is what we believe in. Had I been in the UK, I have the book, I would do the theatric, I can't do it here. Anyway, where does it go wrong though? It goes wrong when Hayek is, again, he cannot integrate politics with economics and ethics, all this together. So he, he plays with some definitions and he says, well, coercion is bad to begin with, but you know what? Coercion is a relative term because for example, the government is coercing you, but we wouldn't be without the government. Therefore, in a way there is also coercion that leads to freedom. And he uses some examples which are the equivalent of, have you heard the example that says, where if there's only one electricity company, that electricity company cannot, 
discriminate against you. And Hayek opens this short, small window. And from opening this small window, it says, well, coercion sometimes is okay, but only when it comes to, you know, some health and safety regulations or yeah. some taxation or some very basic provisions. And you take it, you stretch it, you stretch it, you stretch it, you stretch it. And it's not impossible to make the case that basically Hayek is more of a towards the side of social democracy rather than the side of radical capitalism or however one would want to call it. That, that, that's fascinating. And I know that, you know, there's elements of Hayek and also Milton Friedman that, you know, as an objectivist, people always say, oh, you know, you're for free markets and even Milton Friedman wanted us exactly. that. Exactly, exactly, ha- exactly. That's, 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 a, that's a great, that's why, so last, last week, a friend of the show commented, oh, why do you attack Rothbard? Why don't you attack the communists? Like, what's the point? Is there anyone who watches the show who, who <laughs> would confuse Ayn Rand with, well, I'm not sure, was this Ayn Rand or was this Eric Honecker? I can't remember. No, but it's exactly what you said. So when you have a discussion, for example, like around taxation, the Keynesian is going to tell you, look, don't take it to extreme. Either your guy Hayek says taxes are okay. And see also why Hayek really, really, why integration is important. So again, why did Ayn Rand start from metaphysics and epistemology? Because it's about what is the metaphysical, let's say, nature of man. Put in simple words. What do human beings require in order to survive and flourish? Some particular things. Freedom is one of these things. Now, Hayek tries to approach freedom from a different angle. So here is his take. His take is that, look, coercion is okay. No, coercion is basically not okay. But if it's for the greater, if, if, the ben- if, if let's say, the benefits uh, overweight the costs, if hmm. it's predictable and if it's something that you can program it in advance and it's, it's, it's uh, implemented on everyone, then it's okay. So, for example, Hayek says military service is okay. Taxation huh. is okay. Why? Because the benefits are more than the costs. And, of course, our question would be the benefits of who, for whom to who? and based on what. And also, you could predict it. So, basically, the fact that I was abducted, quote, abducted, okay, not really, but by the Greek state to serve in the army, for Hayek, that's not a problem, because from the day I was born, I knew that I would go to the army. Therefore, that's not a problem. Or that's why we see many people, many Hayekians today being okay with the lockdowns, because, look, now they're part of our reality. We know that at some point they will end. Again, the benefits are more than the cost. Therefore, yeah, okay, look, we like freedom, but... So basically, the higher comes out as a utilitarian. Utilitarian. At the end I'm, of so, the day. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so glad you point that out, Nico. Says, you know, as soon as you separate a value from an individual, value, as you said, and as as Rand says, you know, to who, and then it's it's like either a majority or it's to the state or it's to or there's some plan or someone thinks. And I, I appreciate, and I, I, I remember that you you served in the Greek military service you were coerced to serve and and I'm I didn't know that Hayek would actually approve of that and I'm kind of shocked especially since you know there's a Rand influence to actually getting the draft abolished here in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. you know part of Rand's circle uh took a lot of the ideas that were being discussed at that time to I think it's Marty Armstrong went to uh, work in the Nixon administration and ultimately that that's helped what got rid of the draft in the U.S. so Rand was on the right side of that idea. And as you said, it came back to the idea that Rand wasn't just about economics. People say, oh, Ayn Rand, free markets or politics. She had an integrated philosophy. Uh, that's what makes it have the foundation that all these other thinkers do not. Exactly. So this is what's missing from Hayek, this integration. And starting from some proper reality-oriented premises. So Hayek does not do that. Now, He's not part of necessarily of the same epistemology as Mises. So he has his thoughts about praxeology. But I tell you what, we probably need to do a special episode about the epistemology of Hayek and of his, let's say, philosophical approach. This was more or less the, 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 the head titles about Hayek, the good and the bad. Uh, also, well, another thing. Yes, go on. No, no, please, please. 
I encourage people, if they haven't checked it already, to check a book called something like Iron Runs Marginalia. So this is... Oh, I have it. Okay. Have it right here. Hold on. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, I'll keep going. So this is Ayn Rand reading some famous works of your time. Yes, exactly. And leaving comments on the side. And this is shows the comments on the side. The comments on Hayek are, you can get that Ayn Rand is really pissed off, really pissed off. There are some of my favorite comments such as, hey, mystic, uh, this, uh, anyway, she, she's, she's not happy. She's not happy. She's not happy at all. And as you said, although she knew personally oh. Mises, Here's, uh, uh, well, see, I don't want to, uh, here he sa she says, the damn fool, he's crawling to begin with. Why should man apologize for a personal interest? So absolutely recommend. Ex yeah, so she's pissed off with both his approach, but also he, with his quote, not quote, like I would call conventional morality. So again, you could see, you could be, a social democrat and be happy with how you can say, say, look, we are all, we want the better, we want the, how it's called, the good for the, the, the larger amount of people. That's what we want. Now, how you give us some good tools, therefore it's okay. And I think there was the line, we're all Hayekians now. You can listen, you can hear this also from social democrats. So again, once more, why are we doing this? This is not bashing Hayek. And this is not saying we are the real, radicals or freedom and not Hayek. This is again, paying respect to the great economist, but also highlighting why economics is not the beginning at the end. Actually economics is somewhere, it's more like an afterthought. So once you've set your philosophical cornerstones, then economics come and it's a discipline. And again, giants like Mises, people like Hayek, again, they have contributed a lot. But seeing an economist, who hasn't got an integrated view as a solid defender of freedom is a mistake. And again, if you have any doubt, go read the political texts of Hayek and go tell me if I'm right. Anyway. Uh, and, 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 and read off, obviously also Ayn Rand herself, uh, first and foremost, and also read Harry Binswanger's, I think you'd agree, Nico's uh, uh, perspectives on Rand versus Hayek. And I'll say, I know we're, we're uh, Kind of finishing up here, but thank you so much, Gene, uh, for your support of the Ayn Rand Center UK. And thank you for all our listeners and viewers support. We've got, oh, I don't know, 3,200 people watching right now, but only 10 thumbs up. So let's see a few more thumbs up right now and certainly share and subscribe and be part of what we're doing here every day on the Daily Objective. And actually the discussion is not over. We're going to move it to Clubhouse. So in Clubhouse, the discussion is always more spicy because it's, it's more free flowing. <laughs> so if you want more insights on Hayek's life, if you want more insights on Hayek the good or Hayek the bad, or if you are a Hayekian, if you are a utilitarian, if you are a social democrat, anything, and you want to challenge whatever something that we said, or you want to point towards a mistake, more than happy to have you there. How can you oh, find yeah. us? If you really want to talk some major shit about Hayek, get with us on Clubhouse after the show. Yes, so how can you find us? Find the leader Maximus, Razi Ginsberg, who is initiating these clubhouse, how to call them, rooms, events, I don't know how they're called. Anyway, we are migrating there. Also, one more thing, one more thing. Tomorrow, every Saturday, Anron Center UK's members, uh, we have the Leonard Peikoff courses discussions. Obviously. To celebrate that we finished the first course, which was the philosophy of objectivism, and before we move to the second course, which is the art of thinking, what we're gonna do tomorrow is have a free session, not only for members, it's like a teaser session. And it's not on a whole lecture series, it's on one lecture. And one of his brilliant lecture on modern art and schizophrenia. In my opinion, the most enjoyable of all of Peikoff's lectures. So only for one Saturday, the Saturday peak of courses, which maybe we need to find a cool name for, for, the, for the Saturday courses. Only for one Saturday, open to everyone. How to find out more? I'm not sure to be honest. Just drop, drop, send a DM to Anron Center UK or to Razi, and he's gonna direct you. Okay, we migrate to Clubhouse. Thank you so much for this week, everyone. We had the event on Monday. This was so soul satisfying. 
Then on Tuesday, we, pay, we paid tribute to our mentors. Obviously, Jonathan is one of the people we paid tribute to together with Raka. And let's finish the week on a, on a cool way talking about Hayek on Clubhouse. Jonathan, from me and from Jonathan, bye everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>